it is time for another ultra relaxing uh, sports scandal story time video and this one was suggested by Nate in the comments don't forget to let me know uh, in the comments which scandal we should cover next uh, but this one is the Baltimore Colts relocation in the dead of night in 1984 I really like this story it's drama filled <laughs> Um, also, I'm in the process of setting up a bit of a filming space, something more, uh, permanent. So I hope you can bear with me while I, while I figure this out. I think you're a little bit closer to me than, uh, than you usually are. But, moving on from that, we're here to talk about, uh, yet another NFL scandal. So, remember, in my Cleveland Browns uh, relocation scandal video, um, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. Um, I, I do regular sports controversy videos, and I'll link the Cleveland R Browns video in the description uh, of this one. But in that video, I mentioned that when the Browns were offered to move to Baltimore yeah, to move to Baltimore by John Moog of the, the Stadium Authority um, that politicians in Baltimore were really hesitant to have that happen because they were still feeling the effects feeling the pain of uh, the Colts relocating to uh, to Indianapolis, as we now know. Well, this is that story. So first, some background. Uh, the Baltimore Colts arrived from Dallas in 1953. They came from a long sort of lineage, a long history for this, this football um, that started in 1913 as the Dayton Triangles and I, I think I'm eventually going to tell that whole story um, in a separate video of um, how we got, you know, basically from the Dayton Triangles in 1913 to the Indianapolis Colts of today um, they were one of the first NFL teams to have cheerleaders, to have a marching band, which will come up later <laughs> in the story, um, and a team fight song along with, see everything, everything's tying together, along with uh, the Washington Redskins, who we've also talked about. So, in May uh, of 1969, the city of Baltimore, like in so many of this, these cases, um, a lot of these relocation stories have something to do with the stadium. At one point, and in many cases, the stadium is owned by the city or by the state. And the city of Baltimore in 69 decided to uh, increase the rent of Memorial Stadium for the Colts. Now, the Colts owner at the time, his name was Carol Rosenblum, he uh, had already said that Memorial Stadium was antiquated um, and he threatened to move the Colts out of Baltimore if if no improvements to the stadium were made. In fact, he considered using $20 million um, of his own money to help fund a new purpose-built stadium uh, in Baltimore. And that $20 million back then is about 170 
170 million today. So there was already big problems, clearly, with the stadium back then. So by November 1971, uh, Rosenblum finally announced that the Colts would not return uh, to Memorial Stadium when their lease came up after the 1972 season. Alright, so we'll play out our contract and then we're, we're out of Memorial Stadium. And they just were not interested in negotiating with the city anymore. Those conversations were over. But he didn't just want to move out of Memorial Stadium, oh no. He wanted out of Baltimore completely uh, for several reasons. For one, team revenue was an issue, you know, ticket sales, merchandise sales, um, broadcast rights. Um, he also had problems with the Baltimore Orioles ownership and, you know, they obviously ran in the same circles, had to compete for a lot of the same funding. Um, they were both out of Memorial Stadium and both uh, sort of despised the stadium. And he also had sort of a running feud uh, with the Baltimore press. So he was, he was done with the city, he was done with Maryland. And ultimately, what ended up happening after the 1971 season is that Rosenblum swapped franchises with uh, Robert Ursay. He, he took ownership of the Los Angeles Rams, and Robert Ursay took ownership of uh, the Colts. So, sort of a good solution for Rosenblum. He's out of town. Baltimore's also happy because the team stays. So, that year, same year, 1971, the mayor of Baltimore at that point, uh, William Donald Schaefer, and the governor of Maryland, uh, Marvin Mendel, they created a stadium committee to examine uh, the city's stadium needs. A little too late for Rosenblum, <laughs> but uh, what came out of that report was, among other things, that 10,000 seats at Memorial Stadium had poor a view of the field, 20,000 seats were outdated bench seats that had no back support, 7,000 seats were just temporary bleachers um, that were really poorly constructed. There was not enough office space for the front office of either the Colts or the Orioles, much less both teams at once. Um, both teams had to share the same locker room, and uh, the number of bathrooms in the stadium was deemed inadequate. And that's just a portion of the issues or the sort of the conclusions that they came to uh, in, in their investigations. So after that report came out, um, state planners came up with a project called the Balto Dome. The Balto Dome. Um, the original plan was to build a, a stadium near Baltimore's inner harbor, known as Camden Yard. Um, that sort of planned stadium, the Balto Dome, that would hold um, 70,000 fans for football games, 55,000 fans for baseball games, and they also planned to have an arena attached that would seat 20,000 for hockey and basketball games. It would cost about 78 
million dollars, but it would keep everyone happy. Um, not only the Orioles and the Colts, but also the stadium uh, complex authority. Um, and actually, Ursay agreed to take over the Colts uh, on the basis that the city promised to build um, the stadium. So the city had committed to building a new stadium as part of Ursay's uh, agreeing to come and take over the team. Um, and it would also please uh, Mayor Schaefer and Governor Mandel. So it was the solution to fix everyone's problems. However, they weren't able to get support to pass the proposal for the Balto Dome at the Maryland Legislature. So, in February of 1974, Governor Mandel pulled the plug on the Balto Dome. So we're, you know, almost three, four years into the planning of this thing, and all of a sudden, it's like it never happened. Uh, and actually, the Orioles owner at the time, uh, Gerald Hofberger, he said, I will bow to the will of the people. They have told us what they want to tell us. First, they don't want a new park. And second, they don't want a club. All right, so the, the Orioles owner is just putting it all on the table. Fine, you don't want to support us for a new stadium. Clearly, you don't want a professional sports team here. But Ursay, he was willing to wait. He was more patient than the Orioles owner. He said, it's not a matter of saying that there will be no stadium. It's a matter of getting the facts together so everybody is happy when they build the stadium. I'm a patient man. I think the people of Baltimore are going to see those new stadiums in New Orleans and Seattle opening in a year or two around the country, and they are going to realize they need a stadium for conventions and other things besides football. So, while the Orioles, you know, Balto Dome is cancelled, the Orioles owner says, that's it, that's the final straw, I'm out of here. Bob Ursay, um, the owner of the Colts, says, we'll wait, we'll wait, this is not, you know, where the buck ends. We just have to do it right, we have to come by a stadium the right way. However, Another, however, uh, Baltimore's comptroller at the time, he sort of threw a wrench in that idea. Um, he was against using any public funds uh, to build a new stadium. And so during the 1974 elections, he had an amendment uh, to the city's charter placed on the ballot. It was known as Question P. Basically, it called for declaring the 33rd Street Stadium, Memorial Stadium, as a memorial to war veterans and prohibiting use of city funds for construction of any other stadium. And the measure passed, with 56% of the votes being in favor of Question P. And that effectively destroyed any chance of a new sports complex. Um, something like the Balto Dome, something smaller than the Balto Dome, um, being built in Baltimore. So, two years later, 1976, uh, Ursay was in talks with Phoenix, Arizona, uh, about possibly moving the team there. Uh, and then the next year, 1977, he began talking with Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, and actually, in 1976, he acknowledged publicly that he had received uh, an attractive offer to move the team to 
to Phoenix so he wasn't, you know, hiding the fact after he said, I'm patient, I'll wait for a stadium. Then the elections came and then he said, you know what, we, I am in talks with other teams. So at least you can say this for, you know, for Ursay is that he was, he was honest leading up to the scandal. <laughs> so, in 1977, he said, I like Baltimore, and I want to stay there, but when are we going to find out something about our stadium? I'm getting offers from towns like Indianapolis to build me a new stadium and give me other inducements to move there. I don't want to, but I'd like to see some action in Baltimore. Right, so the other uh, inducements, as he said, were things like loans, below market rate, um, you know, practice facilities, that kind of thing. So they were, they were coming at him with attractive offers. Um, but still, nothing happened for a couple of years. Um, you know, he wasn't kidding about being patient. In 1979, Hofberger sold the Orioles to Edward Bennett Williams. And Williams said that 1980 would be sort of a trial year for the fans of Baltimore. Kind of a threat, he said. Um, you know, you have to show up this season, otherwise we're gone. Um, he said that the stadium had huge problems, which is something that we've heard repeatedly now. You know, he didn't come up with this. And he said, uh, frankly, I don't know if those problems will ever be solvable at that location. So, knowing that the Orioles were looking to be on their way out for real, for real, um, Ursay began shopping the Colts around seriously as well. Right? So he'd been receiving offers up until that point, but now he's like, the Orioles are making moves. We need to be making moves. Um, so he talked to people from Los Angeles, from Memphis, and from Jacksonville. Um, he also went to Maryland's uh, new governor at that point, Harry Hughes, and he requested $25 million in renovations to Memorial Stadium. So again, actually making a real effort to keep the team in Baltimore, if at all possible, with sort of the restrictions that he's, you know, being presented. Um, now, the state would have agreed to uh, those renovations that Ursay requested if the Colts and the Orioles agreed to a long-term lease, uh, but both teams refused to sign long-term, so no money ever came for renovations. But still, nothing happens for another five years. But finally, and this is where the scandal all goes down. On March 2nd, 1984, NFL owners uh, voted to give Ursay uh, permission, essentially, to move the franchise to any city of his choosing. And uh, Phoenix and Indianapolis were still on his radar from, like, almost 10 years ago in the mid-70s. So, you know, he was visiting, he was talking to people from those cities, but nothing concrete had happened till that point. But then, the Maryland General Assembly, uh, they decided to get involved. And this is, this is what caused everything to happen. So, on March 27th, 1984, uh, the Maryland Senate passed 
passed legislation that gave the city of Baltimore the right to seize ownership of the cults by eminent domain. Um, now, if you're in the UK, you might know it as compulsory purchase. Um, here in Canada, it's known as expro expropriation, and I think they use the same term expropriation in, in most uh, English-speaking countries. Um, basically, it's the power of the state, the government, to uh, take private property for public use and then of course they have to you know pay for the for the loss of that private owner so basically Maryland is saying listen there's a there's a public um, advantage there's you know there's a, a, a part of the cult that are for the public's good and so we're allowed to force you to sell us the cults um, and that was sort of the nail in the coffin so to speak for the Baltimore cult, cults as an organization um, one of the counsels for the cults Michael Chernoff he said they not only threw down the gauntlet but they put a gun to his head, meaning Ursae, and cocked it and asked, Want to see if it's loaded? They forced him to make a decision that day. People talk all the time about how we moved under the cover of darkness. But tell me, who was laying in the weeds? I think Chernoff was a fan of Dirty Harry. <laughs> but you heard what he said, right? So people talk all the time about how we moved under the cover of darkness. So here's where everything kicks off. Because everything, so far as, as we said, you know, it was very public. Ursae was always very honest about talking to other cities. He was honest about his willingness to work with Baltimore to improve the stadium. But you know, this was a decade-long process, and the day after Maryland passed the eminent domain legislation, March 28th, 1984, the uh, Phoenix group, who had been talking to Ursae, uh, they withdraw their offer because of the Maryland uh, Senate's decision. They don't want to get into, a, you know, a legal battle with with another city, another state. So that afternoon, Ursae calls Mayor Hudnut of Indianapolis. The city of Indianapolis. I mean, Hudnut on behalf of the city. Offers the Colts a $12.5 million loan, a $4 million training complex, and the use of the brand new $77.5 million stadium, the Hoosier Dome, and Ursae agrees. So, after Mayor Hudnut gets off the phone with Ursae, he calls his neighbor. His neighbor is John B. Smith, the CEO of Mayflower Transit which is an Indiana-based moving company. Smith, the mayor's neighbor, he sends 15 Mayflower trucks to Baltimore in that moment. They arrive at the Colts facility in the middle of a snowstorm at 10 p.m. See, um, Ursa and Hudnut they wanted to move quickly because they thought that Governor Hughes could sign the eminent domain bill by any time and then by law they'd have to stay. Right? It, it, it could allow the state and the city to seize ownership of the cults as soon as that, 
that next morning. So, workers loaded up the trucks, all of the team's belongings, and they leave for Indianapolis. And within eight hours of the trucks arriving in Baltimore, at Owings Mills, the Colts skip down. Now, Ursay, um, he thought that the Maryland State Police might try to delay their leaving the state until after the eminent domain law uh, was signed and came into effect. And so he asked the drivers, ordered the drivers, to avoid using uh, Interstate 70 until after they had left the state of Maryland. So each of the 15 trucks took a separate route out of the state, north from Owings Mill into Pennsylvania, and then got on the I-70. And then, as each truck later passed from Ohio into Indiana, the Indiana State Police would escort, they would meet the truck at the state line and escort it into Indianapolis. And they did the same process 15 times for 15 trucks. And actually, whether or not Ursay did the objectively right thing to do, uh, he wasn't completely out of his mind because later that day, we're now on March 29th, the House of Delegates actually did pass the, uh, the bill by a count of 103 to 19, and Governor Hughes signed it. But by that time, all that was left for them to, to seize was an empty facility at Owings Mills. Later that day, in the following days, the following weeks, um, Baltimore's Mayor Schaefer he did interviews where he was basically in tears about um, the Colts leaving. Uh, and despite saying previously that um, the city of Baltimore would not build a new stadium, uh, he placed the building of a new stadium at the top of his legislative agenda. But it was all too late the Colts. Um, if you remember John Moog from the Cleveland Brown video, uh, he had tried to get the Browns to Maryland in, in the 90s. Um, he stated in sworn testimony in front of the U.S. Senate a subcommittee responsible for the Fan Freedom and Community Protection Act. It was the failure of our local, meaning Baltimore, our local and state elected officials in Maryland to provide the Colts with a firm proposal for a new stadium that led Mr. Ursay to accept an offer from Indianapolis to play in a new dome in that city. So even, you know, Moog has blamed the city and the state rather than, than putting it on Ursay. And, as you can expect, um, Ursay himself said that his move to Indianapolis was a direct result of the eminent donate, domain bill. Now, it's still debatable today what kind of reach the government and the eminent domain law could have had if Ursay had stayed in Baltimore and had not moved overnight, um, it's considered very unlikely 
that NFL owners would have gone for a government owning or operating a franchise. Uh, they actually forbid governments from owning a stake in teams since 2006 or 2007. Side note, the Houston Texans are the exception. Uh, the Harris County government owns 5% of the team and that was grandfathered in when that rule was made. So going back to the Colts, um, even though it was unlikely that they would allow this to happen, uh, the NFL was reluctant to engage in litigation um, after they had a whole ordeal with uh, the Raiders owner uh, basically forcing the NFL to allow him to move his team from Oakland uh, to Los Angeles um, you know the state of Maryland could have filed a similar antitrust uh, suit against the league if they had refused to approve the transfer. So maybe the NFL would have gone hands off, maybe they would have blocked it, but we never got to the point of finding out because the Colts disappeared overnight. Uh, in elections that year, city voters voted to repeal question P by a vote of 62% to 38% in favor of repealing. Uh, the move also forced city and state officials to really look at the Orioles who had stayed behind were still in Baltimore. Um, and they were Baltimore's only remaining pro sports team or ma major league team. So, Oriole Park at Camden Yards was built and opened in 1992. Interestingly, this is a little tidbit that I enjoy. At the time of the move, um, the marching band was staying behind, and they, you know, the, the marching band itself did not want to move to Indiana, and. On the night of the move, their uniforms were in dry cleaning. And the band president uh, and some of his associates, they got a hold of the uniforms from the dry cleaners and they hid them in a cemetery <laughs> until eventually Robert Ursay's wife told them, you can keep them. We're not going to try to take the uniforms from you. Um, so the band ended up staying together uh, for the next 12 years in, in Baltimore. And actually, they ended up joining the CFL team uh, that moved to Baltimore. That became their band. Um, and if you want to find out more about what happened to that CFL team, and especially how Baltimore came to have the Ravens, um, I encourage you to watch my Cleveland Browns uh, relocation scandal video. I'll have it linked in the description below this video. It picks up really nicely from here. But guys, that is the story of how the Baltimore Colts skipped town in the dead of night in 1984. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you think Baltimore and Maryland um, sort of forced Ursay's hand and forced the covert operation or if um, Ursay was the one to, to ultimately make a mistake here. And I will see you tomorrow for another video.